Section 11.10, Taylor and McLaurin series. Previously, we saw that if we have a um, function similar to 1 over 1 minus x, then we can use the series for 1 over 1 minus x, adapt it slightly, and find a series for that function also. However, in general, we'd like to be able to find some sort of power series representation for functions that are more dissimilar to 1 over 1 minus x. So we have this theorem that says that if a function has a power series representation, then it must look like this, where we have cn times x minus a to the n, where our cn's, or each of our coefficients, are the nth derivative at a of the function divided by n factorial. You have to be kind of careful here though. Notice this does not guarantee that a function can be represented by a power series. It just says that if it is true that it could be represented by a power series, then it must look like this. So we'll have to, when we look at functions, um, be careful to first see if the function, well, not necessarily first, but we'll have to see if the function definitely has a power series representation, and then we can use this to show that the power series representation of the function would be this. So let's see if we can prove this really quick. Notice that if our function does have a power series of representation, which is what we're assuming, then we would have f of x equal to our first constant, c0 plus our second one, c1 times x minus a plus c2 times x minus a squared plus c3 times x minus a cubed and so on because this is just what a power series is. So to prove our theorem about the coefficients relating to the nth derivative, we should try to figure out what each of these coefficients is equal to. Remember this power series converges for x minus a less than r. So let's look at what this first coefficient would be. Well, we could plug in a and then that will make this term zero, this term zero, this term zero, etc. It'll make all of the other terms zero. So that implies that f of a must equal c zero, because plugging in a, nothing is left. So now we know what the first constant is. If we take the derivative of f of x, then notice that c zero is a constant, so it disappears, and then c1 times x would just be c1 when we take the derivative, c1 times minus a would disappear, so we'll end up with c1, and we'll end up with 2 times c2 times x minus a, because we just do the chain rule over here, and the derivative of that guy is just 1, so we can just hop out the 2 and reduce the power by 1. We do the same thing for the next term. We get 3 times c3 times x minus a squared. And we get 4 times c4 times x minus a cubed, which is the power rule and chain rule. And we know that this converges for the same values that our series before we differentiated it converges, because it's a power series. So if we do our same trick as last time, we can plug in a for our derivative for x, and we can see that all of these guys collapse and just leave us with c1. So c1 must be f prime of a. Let's see if we can get the next constant, the third constant. So if we take our second derivative, this guy disappears, we just get 2 times c2 plus, well now this 2 has to hop out in front, so we get 2 times 3 times c3 times x minus a. And we get 3 times 4 times c4 times x minus a squared, and so on. So again, we'll plug in a. We'll see that the second derivative at a must be equal to 2 times c2. So we have to be a little bit careful because now there's a coefficient in our coefficient. How about
about the third derivative. Make that a little bit closer. So I got 2 times 3 times c3, because this guy disappears. And then I've got 2 times 3 times 4 times c4 times x minus a plus 3 times 4 times 5 times c5 times x minus a squared and so on. So that means that our third derivative at a must be equal to 2 times 3 times c3. And now it seems like there's a pattern here because 2 times 3 is the same as 1 times 2 times 3 which is 3 factorial. Notice that the next coefficient, if we were to solve for it, would be 4 factorial. And then we would get 5 factorial because this guy would hop out and we'd do another derivative. So it looks like if we, we have a factorial times our constant is our nth derivative. Even if you go back, 2, two is just 2 factorial, 1 is just 1 factorial, 0 is just 0 factorial. So it looks like, in general, we have the nth derivative at a equal to 2 times 3 times 4, and so on, until n. And that's just n factorial times cn. So that means that if we solve for cn, we can just divide both sides by n factorial, we get that our constants, our coefficients, are the nth derivative at a divided by n factorial, assuming that f has a power series representation. Notice that we are assuming that the zeroth derivative f to the zero of f is just the original function. And that way this works for all of our different derivatives. So I think that we have sufficiently convinced ourselves that this uh, theorem is true. Now we know what our constants are, assuming that f has a power series representation. But remember, like I said, we have to be careful to see that it even does have a power series representation in the first place. So next our, we have a definition that our Taylor series of the function f at a, or about a, is just this power series representation with these coefficients. So now we have a name for this special power series that represents functions. Sometimes we look at a equals zero, in which case we have a lot of stuff collapse. Instead of x minus a, it's just x. So in that case, we have f of zero, f prime of zero, f double prime of zero, etc. So because we refer to that so often, we name that series a Maclaurin series. So a Maclaurin series is just a fancy name for a Taylor series that happens to be about zero. As an example, let's find the Maclaurin series for f of x equals e to the x. So what we're going to do is we're going to write out what the series for e to the x would have to be if e to the x has a uh, Maclaurin series. But we don't yet know that it does. But if it did, it would have to be this and follow this pattern. So we know that our pattern involves the nth derivative, so let's take a look at that. We know that that's going to be e to the x no matter how many times we differentiate. And that means that our nth derivative at 0 will be e to the 0, which is 1 for all n. doesn't matter what n is. So that's pretty cool. That means that our series, our Maclaurin series, is the nth derivative at 0 all over n factorial times x to the n which is the sum of x to the n over n factorial, because we said the nth derivative at 0 is always going to be 1. So x to the n over n factorial is just 1 plus x over 1 factorial plus x squared over 2 factorial plus x cubed over 3 factorial, and so on. 
let's do the ratio test to find the radius of convergence of the series. So an plus 1 over an. Well, that's just going to be x to the n plus 1 instead of x to the n over n plus 1 factorial. And then we divide by x to the n over n factorial. So that's the same as multiplying by the reciprocal n factorial over x to the n. So that's the absolute value of x over n plus 1. Because notice that this cancels. We just have an x left. And we can rewrite n plus 1 factorial as n plus 1 times n factorial and then cancel the n factorial. So as n goes to infinity, this thing, it looks like it goes to 0. It doesn't matter what x is. Anything in the top, any finite value in the top divided by some number that becomes arbitrarily large goes to zero. Zero is smaller than one. So no matter what x is, our series converges. So that means the radius of convergence for our series is infinity. It converges for all x. So this is kind of cool. Since this converges for all x, that means that using the test for divergence, we could say that the series or this uh, sequence over here, x to the n over n factorial, must go to zero. Because if the series, if the sequence x to the n over n factorial does not go to zero, then the series can't converge by the test for divergence. The test for divergence says that if your sequence does not go to zero, your series diverges. So this means that the limit of x to the n over n factorial must be equal to zero as n goes to infinity. This wasn't part of the question, but this fact is going to be very useful for us uh, in a minute. Now that we've figured out what the Maclaurin series for e to the x is, it would be really great to know that e to the x has a power series representation, because if it does, then we know what it is. So in order to show that it does, we need um, a little bit more information. We need to know what a remainder term is. By a remainder term, we mean that if we take a look at a series and we look at a finite number of terms, so we chop it off somewhere, notice that's just a polynomial. Because for a power series, we're just looking at uh, Look at this Taylor series over here. All of these things are just some constant times x, some constant times some x squared term, some constant times some x cubed term. If you were to foil all these things out and combine all the terms, it would definitely look like x to the n times some constant plus x to the n minus 1, etc., etc., assuming that you stop somewhere. So you would have to get rid of this. You'd have to stop at some n. If you keep going to infinity, you have a series. But if you stop somewhere, you have a finite number of terms, that's a polynomial. So when we stop somewhere, we call that the nth degree Taylor polynomial. And the difference between the Taylor polynomial and the function, we call the remainder. So if we were to take the limit as n goes to infinity of the remainder and see that that's 0, then that should imply that the uh, function has a uh, Taylor series representation. Think about it. If we have a Taylor polynomial Tn and that approximates some function and then the thing we have left, that remainder term, if that kind of disappears as we go towards infinity, then as the Taylor polynomial goes to infinity, that becomes a Taylor series. As the remainder term goes to zero, it disappears. So we get that the Taylor series must be equal to the function, if the function was equal to the Taylor series plus remainder. OK, so to prove this, it's actually uh, kind of easy. You just look at the limit of the Taylor polynomial. Notice the limit of Taylor polynomial is just the limit of f minus the remainder term by our definition over here. We said that if f is equal to some Taylor polynomial plus some remainder term, well then solve for 
uh, Tn. But the limit of f minus r is the same thing as the limit of f minus the limit of r. The limit of f as we go to infinity is just f of x. We're assuming that the limit of the remainder is zero. Okay, so then the limit of the remainder just disappears. We get that the limit of the Taylor polynomial is equal to the value of the function. So that means that, like we said, whenever we have the limit of the remainder to zero, we'll end up with our series, which is the limit of the Taylor polynomial, becoming the value of the function, becoming the actual function. And it should make sense the limit of a Taylor polynomial is a series because what you do is uh, to get a Taylor polynomial, you stop somewhere. And this is saying, well, actually, don't stop somewhere, keep going to infinity. So you get a series back. Next up, we have Taylor's inequality. Taylor's inequality tells us uh, how bad our estimates could be, how much error we could have. Assuming that we are approximating a Taylor series by a Taylor polynomial. So this is kind of cool, because now we have a bound on our remainder term, this guy. So now we have something that we can take the limit of as n goes to infinity. If the limit is zero, then that guarantees that our function has a Taylor series approximation. And then by our previous theorem, we know what that Taylor series would look like. So uh, to prove this, it's not the easiest thing in the world. What you want to do is look at the integral from a to x of the n plus 1th derivative at t. Notice that that's going to be less than or equal to the integral of uh, m dt by our assumption that the n plus 1th derivative is bounded. That's really important to prove this theorem. So the n plus 1th derivative is always less than or equal to some n. That means that the integrals are always less than or equal to each other. So then you do the integral. You get to the nth uh, derivative at x. You get all of the other stuff on the other side. So you get the nth derivative of x less than or equal to something. And then you repeat the process. And you keep integrating over and over and over again until you get to uh, just f of x, because the remainder term is just f of x minus some Taylor polynomial tn of x. So if you integrate enough times, you'll get to f of x, and you'll get to a form where you have f of x minus tn of x, and then you say that that's the remainder, and that's less than or equal to this, and it'll work out nicely, but uh, it's uh, a bit of work. You can do it for uh, the first uh, case where you're just looking at uh, integrating twice. You look at the second derivative, integrate, integrate again. And then you could look at it integrating three times and so on. But uh, prove it in general is so, you know, a bit more work. So let's take advantage of it. We have that e to the x. Well, we know our series for the x. Let's prove that it's actually equal to the sum of its Maclaurin series now. So we have f of x equal e to the x. We have the nth derivative, or the n plus 1th derivative, equal to e to the x also. So that'll help us find a bound really quick. Remember that to find our bounds, we're assuming that x minus a is less than or equal to d. So it's Maclaurin series, so a is 0. So we have the absolute value of x is less than or equal to d. So we want to find some m that our nth plus 1th derivative will always be less than or equal to. So our nth plus 1th derivative is equal to e to the x. So if x is always less than or equal to d, then this thing will always be less than or equal to e to the d. So that means that we should choose m to be equal to e to the d. And now we can do our Taylor inequality. So we have our remainder term less than or equal to m over n plus 1 factorial times x minus a to the n plus 1. So that's n plus 1 factorial. Uh, actually, how about instead of m, I write e to the d, because that's what we said n was, m was. And then x minus a is just x to the n plus 1. And this is for a 
absolute value of x less than or equal to d. So we just need to take the limit of this thing. If this limit is zero, we're in business. So the limit of e to the d over n plus one factorial times x to the n plus one is equal to e to the d times the limit of absolute value of x to the n plus one over n plus one factorial. E to the d is a constant, so I'll just pull it out. But we just said that we have the limit of x to the n over n factorial equals zero using our test for divergence on the series that we saw converges. So this thing must also go to zero, just n plus one instead of n, same thing. So that means that we have the limit of the absolute value of Rn equals zero by the squeeze theorem. Because notice that it's greater than or equal to zero, and it's less than or equal to this limit that we just saw was zero, so it's squeezed by zero on both sides. We didn't take the limit of Rn directly, but taking the limit of something bigger than Rn is just as good because this thing is not negative. And then we have a theorem that says that the limit of the absolute value being zero implies that the limit of the other function, the other sequence is zero. So that means that the limit of Rn is zero. And that's all we need to say that Ex is actually equal to its Maclaurin series. So Ex is equal to the sum of n equals zero to infinity of x to the n over n factorial, and that always converged, so this is true for all x. So that's pretty cool. That means that if we plug in x equals one, we could say e to the one is the sum from zero to infinity of one over n factorial. So that's just one plus one over one factorial plus one over two factorial plus one over three factorial, and so on. So now we have a way of computing E. Let's find the Taylor series uh, E to the X at A equals two. So this is not gonna be a Maclaurin series because A is not zero, but it's still pretty easy. We look at the nth derivative at two and notice the nth derivative of x is just of e to the x is just e to the x, so this is just going to be e to the two, which is e squared. So that means that we're looking at the sum of the nth derivative at two over n factorial times x minus two to the n. So that's just the sum of e squared because we said that's what the nth derivative of two is, divided by n factorial times x minus two to the n. So we could uh, do the ratio test again and see that r is equal to infinity, similar to how we did it in example one, but we won't bother, you could do it yourself if you want. And we could do the same thing that we did in example two to see that the limit of the remainder term is actually zero but we won't bother again because it's just the exact same thing. So e to the x is actually equal to the sum of its Taylor series centered at two. So that's just e squared over n factorial times x minus two to the n. And that's also true for all x by the same reason as before, r is equal to infinity. So this means that it's more convenient to use uh, this series, if we're looking at uh, an x value of near 2, we could just um, stop after a couple terms if we wanted to approximate it. But uh, if we wanted an x value near 0, it's more convenient to use our other series representation, our Maclaurin series. How about the Maclaurin series for sine of x? Well, we're going to need to look at a bunch of derivatives, right? So let's start with f of x equals sine x. Then we know that f of zero, because it's in the Lorentz series, we're looking at zero, is going to be zero, because sine of zero is zero. 
All right, well, how about f prime of x? That's cosine of x. So that means that f prime of 0 is 1. So unfortunately, unlike e, these are not all the same. So we'll have to try to see if we can find a pattern. We'll take another derivative. That's minus sine of x. So f prime, f double prime of 0 is equal to, oh, still 0, because minus sine of 0 is still 0. How about f triple prime? So that's minus cosine of x. So f triple prime is minus cosine of 0, which is minus 1. And then the fourth derivative would just be sine of x again. Cool, so that means we returned right back where we started. So it seems like at this point we're repeating. So we go sine, cosine, minus sine, minus cosine, then sine, cosine, minus sine, minus cosine, infinitely. So now that we know our pattern, I think we can write out our series. We'll say that f of 0 plus f prime of 0 over 1 factorial times x plus, I kind of messed up my pluses over here. It's a little bit better. And we'll have to f double prime of 0 next over 2 factorial times x squared now plus f triple prime of 0 over 3 factorial times x cubed and so on. So this is just equal to x minus x cubed over 3 factorial plus x to the fifth over 5 factorial and then minus x to the seventh over 7 factorial and so on. Notice that a lot of our terms in between disappeared so I went past x cubed because all of our even terms end up being multiplied by 0. This should sort of make sense too because sine is an odd function so we would expect it to only be represented by odd terms but let's see if we can come up with a series representation for this. Well if we're gonna write this as a series or a sigma notation I should say because we already wrote it as a series well, it looks like we're alternating the signs because of our cosines alternating. And we only want to have odd terms in here. So let's throw in a minus 1 to the end to make our signs alternate. And we'll throw an x to an odd exponent. So even is 2n, so we add 1 to make it odd. And then we divide by the exact same factorial as our exponent. So then let's see what our bound on our nth derivative at x is because now all we've done is find the uh, Maclaurin series for sine of x but we have not shown that sine of x is actually represented by its Maclaurin series. In order to do that we have to use our Taylor's inequality. So notice that the nth derivative or the n plus one derivative is what we have to look at of x is either plus sine x minus sine x or plus sine x minus or is plus cosine x minus cosine x. Those are the only four possibilities. So that means that the absolute value of our nth plus one derivative must be less than or equal to one because the absolute value of sine cosine is less than or equal to one. So we should choose m to be equal to one. That's a good bound for our nth plus one derivative. So by Taylor's inequality, our n, the remainder term, will be less than or equal to m over n plus 1 factorial times x to the n plus 1 with the absolute value. So we just took m to be equal to 1. So this is just absolute value of x to the n plus 1 over n plus 1 factorial, which as we said before, just definitely goes to 0. 
as n goes to infinity. So that means that by the exact same logic as before, the absolute value of our remainder term goes to zero by the squeeze theorem. And so our remainder term without the absolute value must also go to zero. Okay, pretty cool. So we just proved that sine is actually represented by its Maclaurin series. In other words, sine of x is equal to x minus x cubed over 3 factorial plus x to the fifth over 5 factorial minus x to the seventh over 7 factorial and so on, which is equal to the sum of minus 1 to the n x to the 2n plus 1 over 2n plus 1 factorial for all x because it didn't matter what x was this thing always went to zero so this thing converged for all x I mean, that doesn't necessarily speak to the convergence of the series, but it does tell you about um, when their remainder term would go to zero, which is also what makes it true for all x. Let's find the Maclaurin series for cosine now. We could do the exact same thing as we did before, but a shortcut might be to remember that the derivative for, of uh, sine is cosine. And we know how to differentiate power series by differentiating term by term. So this means that we just have to take the derivative of the series we already worked so hard to get. So we'll differentiate x minus x cubed over 3 factorial plus x to the fifth over 5 factorial minus x to the seventh over 7 factorial and so on. And that ends up becoming 1 minus 3x squared over 3 factorial plus 5x to the fourth over 5 factorial minus 7x to the sixth over 7 factorial and so on. So that's just 1 minus x squared over 2 factorial plus x to the fourth over four factorial minus x to the sixth over six factorial and so on because you can just take off the last term in the factorial three factorial is one times two times three cancel three so you're just left with two factorial you cancel the five you're just left with four factorial and so on so this means that we can write cosine of x equal to 1 minus x squared over 2 factorial plus x to the fourth over 4 factorial minus x to the sixth over 6 factorial and so on which should make sense because cosine's even so we should have all even exponents and this is just the series minus 1 to the n it alternates just like sine does but instead of x to the 2n plus 1, I'll just have x to an even power 2n divided by 2n factorial. And just like for sine, that's true for all x. How about the Maclaurin series for x times cosine x? Again, you could, you know, do a lot of work and figure out what the Maclaurin series would be and then prove that it equals it, but instead why don't we just multiply the series that we found for cosine. So that would be x times the sum from 0 to infinity of minus 1 to the n times x to the 2n over 2n factorial, which is just the sum of 
minus 1 to the n times x to the 2n plus 1 because I can take the x and I can throw it inside of the series because notice the series is dependent on n and not dependent on x. So I can just pop the x in there and increase the exponent by 1. What if we wanted to represent sine x by a different Taylor series that's not a Maclaurin series? Well, then we've got to start from scratch. We'll say that, again, f of x is equal to sine of x, but now our derivative, well, the zeroth derivative, which is the value of the function, will be taken at pi over 3. So that's just the sine of pi over 3, so that's rad 3 over 2. And then we take our next derivative, and we see that that's cosine of x. So we see that f prime of pi over 3 is equal to 1 half, and then f double prime is minus sine, and that's f double prime of pi over 3, which is minus rad 3 over 2, and then f triple prime is minus cosine, so f triple prime of pi over 3 is minus 1 half. We don't have to take the fourth derivative because we already know it's going to repeat just like it did before. So this means that we're looking at f of pi over 3 plus f prime of pi over 3 over 1 factorial times x minus pi over 3 plus f double prime of pi over 3 over 2 factorial times x minus pi over 3 squared plus f triple prime of pi over 3 divided by 3 factorial times x minus pi over 3 cubed, and so on. Notice that this time we don't have all these nice zero terms canceling out half of our terms, so we have to plug in for every single one of these f's. Let's read 3 over 2. And let's see, f prime of pi over 3, so we have 1 over 2 times 1 factorial. And then we have square root of 3 over 2 times 2 factorial. And we'll have 1. Oh, we're alternating. So let's see. This was, it goes plus plus, minus, minus. So these two are plus, so this should be a minus. And then the next one's minus. So it doesn't quite alternate. It sort of alternates. So we have 1 over 2 times 3 factorial times x minus pi over 3 cubed now we could prove that um, this is actually equal to sine of x, but uh, it's pretty much the exact same thing as what we did in example 4. We just replace x with x minus pi over 3. So we'll just uh, assume that we did that and say that sine of x is equal to this series. Let's write it in segment notation though. We have to be a little bit creative because we don't have half of our terms canceling but we do have half of our terms with rad 3 over 2, and we have half of our terms with a half, so we need to write those separately. So how about we write the rad 3 over 2 terms? So those are all the even ones. So we have minus 1 to the n, because those do alternate the even ones. Notice this is positive, this is negative, the next one will be positive. So we'll have rad 3 over 2, and we we'll have even factorials, 2n factorial on the bottom. So that takes care of all of our even terms here. 
but we still have all of our odd terms to worry about. So we have to add those two because none of them were zero in this case. So those will also alternate and they'll be one half because that was the coefficient over there. And then we'll have an odd factorial and x minus pi over 3 to an odd power, so 2n plus 1. So if you thought that was a lot of work, you're going to love this. Let's try to find the Maclaurin series for 1 plus x to the k. Well, we'll have to find a pattern. So first we have f of x equals 1 plus x to the k. So we could say f of 0 is equal to 1. It's 1 to the k is 1. And our first derivative would be k, hopping on in front, times 1 plus x to the k minus 1 by the power rule and chain rule. So the first derivative at 0 would just be k. And then let's see what our second derivative would be. So again, the k minus 1 hops out, it becomes k minus 2, so we have k times k minus 1 times 1 plus x to the k minus 2. So that means that our second derivative at 0 is k times k minus 1. For our third derivative, we have k times k minus 1 times k minus 2 times 1 plus x to the k minus 3. So that means that our third derivative at 0 is k times k minus 1 times k minus 2. So it looks like we can identify the pattern now. If we would keep going to n terms, our nth derivative at x would be equal to k times k minus 1, and so on, until we got to k minus 1, uh, it looks like 1 less than the number of derivative we're at. So we could say n minus 1. But how about I distribute the negative, so minus n plus 1. And then we have our 1 plus x to the k minus n. So that means that the nth derivative at 0 is equal to k times k minus 1 times and so on until we get to k minus n plus 1. So we could write that our series our Maclaurin series is the nth derivative at 0 over n factorial times x to the n, and that's just going to be the sum of k times k minus 1 until we get to k minus n plus 1 all over n factorial times x to the n. And this is actually called the binomial series. It has a name because of the uh, binomials that we're multiplying here. So how about we do the ratio test to see when this thing converges. So let's look at an plus 1 over an. Well, that's just going to be k times k minus 1 multiplied through until we get to k minus n plus 1. But then we have to add another, because remember what we did was we had k minus n minus 1, but we're going to the n plus 1th term, so we're just going to subtract n for the next term. So it will be k minus n times x to the n plus 1. We just go one more. 
and that's divided by n plus 1 factorial and then we multiply by the reciprocal which is let's see I'll do the n factorial first so we get k times k minus 1 until we get to k minus n plus 1 times x to the n and let's see if we can simplify this a little bit but we do get a lot of cancellation here it looks like all of this cancels with all of this and this guy cancels well, the n cancels with this and then the most of the factorials cancel so we just end up with absolute value of k minus n over n plus 1 we can take n plus 1 outside of the absolute value because n is just starting at 0 and then times the absolute value of x. So let's divide the numerator and denominator by n so that we can take this limit. So I can also switch the order here because absolute value of a difference doesn't matter the order that I subtract them in because it'll just be positive anyway in the end. So I'll do 1 minus k over n, dividing that by n and switching the order. And I will divide the bottom by n and get 1 plus 1 over n. And then as we go towards infinity, this goes to 0, this goes to 0, so I just get 1 times the absolute value of x. So by the ratio test, this thing will converge provided the absolute value of x is less than 1. So this tells us that the binomial series converges if the absolute value of x is less than 1 and diverges if the absolute value of x is greater than 1 by the ratio test. So notice that even after all that work, all we did was find the Lorentz series for the binomial series. We didn't actually prove that it's equal to the binomial series. So in order to do that, you have to show that Rn approaches 0, or do some other kind of technique. Showing that Rn approaches 0 is actually pretty hard, so we're not going to do that. As an exercise in Stewart, it's uh, outlined another technique where you can compare the value of the function to its derivative, and then take another derivative, and then you know, figure out that it must be equal to 1 plus x to the k, but we're not going to go through that. Instead, how about we move on to another example where we find the Maclaurin series for the function 1 over square root of 4 minus x and its radius of convergence. Oh, by the way, notice this notation over here for the uh, coefficients for this guy. These are called binomial coefficients, and this set of parentheses is read as k choose n. So that's that's how you read that. And then it, this is what it means. It's just a shorthand. So it's not a normal set of parentheses. So let's find the Maclaurin series for the function 1 over square root of 4 to minus x. So the cool thing about having the binomial series is that now anything that we can make look like a binomial, we could actually find the uh, series representation of. And using our theorem, we'll say that it actually equals it, even though we didn't prove that. So we have 1 over square root of 4 minus x is equal to 1 over the square root of 4 times 1 minus x over 4. I'm factoring out the 4 because I want to make this look like a binomial. So the square root of 4 is just 2, so this is 1 over 2 times the square root of 1 minus x over 4, and that's just equal to a half times 1 minus x over 4 to the minus 1 half power. Now that I have a binomial to a power, I can use my uh, binomial series that we just calculated, the Maclaurin series, 
and we say that this will be half of the series uh, where we have our coefficients minus one half choose n times minus x over 4 to the n. So this parentheses is the special parentheses that we use as shorthand for our coefficients and this parentheses is a normal parentheses that we just use to say that we're multiplying. So this is equal to one half times one plus minus one half times minus x over four plus minus one half times minus three over two because our next one just goes up one and then over two factorial and then times minus x over four squared and then our next one is minus one half times minus three over two and then we have to go up one more so minus five over two all over three factorial times minus x over four to the third and then we'll add keep going and so on until we get to minus one half times minus three over two times minus five over two and so on to an arbitrary term minus one half minus n plus one all over n factorial times minus x over four to the n and then we just keep going because our series never stops. Okay, so we'll do a little bit of simplifying. Uh, notice that our first term is still one, but our second term be plus one eighth times x. And then for our third term, we have one times three on the top, but then we have two times two times to four squared, so four times four squared, that's the same thing as, you know, 64, which is just eight squared. So we could write this as two factorial times eight squared times x squared. And then add that to one times three times five over well, in this case, we have 2 times 2 times 2 again, times 4 cubed. Notice that's just going to be 8 cubed. And times x cubed, and so on. So we have identified a sort of pattern here. We have 1 times 3 times 5, and so on, until we get to 2n minus 1, all over n factorial times 8 to the n times x to the n. So that's our series, and I'm going to try to write it in sigma notation, and that converges when minus x over 4 is less than 1, which means it converges when mod x is, or absolute value of x is less than 4. So our radius of convergence r is equal to 4. OK, I think we had enough of the binomial series. How about we do another one that we looked, we'll re revisit sort of one that we looked at in the past. Remember that the um, sum of x to the n over n starting at 1, alternating, was the natural logarithm, which is pretty similar to what this is. It looks like it's alternating. It looks like it's going to be roughly uh, half to the n. Let's see. We'll write the sum from n equals 1 to infinity of minus 1 to the n minus 1, because the first one's positive, and it looks like it's 1 over whatever number it is, n. 
times and power of 2. So n times 2 to the n. So that's equal to, like I said, the sum from 1 to infinity of minus 1 to the n minus 1 times 1 half to the n over n. So that's x to the n over n. In the previous section, we compared that to 1 over 1 minus x. We said that that was equal to the natural log of 1 plus x. So this is the natural log of 1 plus a half. So that's the natural log of 3 over 2. So now we have just tons of formulas to choose from. We've got formulas for sine, cosine, uh, tan inverse. We have formulas for natural log, formulas for E. We could just use all of those to find sums of different series that hopefully match to one of them. How about uh, the integral of E to the minus x squared dx? So it'd be great if we could express that as a series because we'd actually be able to uh, calculate it. Remember that trying to get the integral of e to the minus, minus x squared is pretty hard, so we know that we have a series for e to the x, so we can just adapt that. e to the minus x squared must be equal to the sum of minus x squared to the n over n factorial instead of x to the n over n factorial. So that's just the sum of minus 1 to the n times x to the 2n over n factorial, which is 1 minus x squared over 1 factorial plus x to the 4th over 2 factorial minus x to the 6th over 3 factorial and so on. So now we can integrate because we can integrate power series. We integrate minus c to the x squared dx and we get the integral of 1 minus x squared over 1 factorial plus x to the fourth over 2 factorial minus x to the sixth over 3 factorial and so on with an arbitrary term of minus 1 to the n over x minus 1 to the n with times x to the 2n over n factorial and so on. So integrating 0 gets us a constant, integrating 1 gets us x, then we've got x cubed over 3 times 1 factorial plus x to the fifth over 5 times 2 factorial minus x to the seventh over 7 times 3 factorial and so on. Pretty cool. Now we actually have a way of uh, approximating this thing. Well we had a way of approximating it but now we have a way of using series. We actually have a way of writing this thing. So Let's uh, evaluate it from 0 to 1, and we can do it correct within an error of 0 0.001, because notice the series is alternating, so we'll just use our alternating series estimation theorem. So our integral from 0 to 1 of e to the minus x squared dx is equal to x minus x cubed over 3 times 1 factorial plus x to the fifth over 5 times 2 factorial minus x to the seventh over 7 times 3 factorial plus x to the ninth over 9 times 4 factorial and so on from 0 to 1. Notice I didn't put the c because it's going to cancel anyway. You can just choose c to be equal to 0. It doesn't make a difference. So we have 1 minus 1 third plus 1 tenth minus 1 over 42 plus 1 over 2 16 and so on. And that's going to be approximately 1 minus 1 third plus one-tenth 
minus 1 over 42 plus 1 over 216 and I'll just stop over there using a calculator or patience you get 0.7475 and our alternating series estimation theorem says that the remainder after uh, n equals 4 is less than or equal to b5, which in this case we didn't write it, but you can see it's going to be 1 over 11 times 5 factorial. So that's 1 over 1320, which is definitely less than 0.00. .00 one. So we've approximated this thing within an error of 0.01. So Taylor series also give us a way of evaluating limits that we didn't have before. Notice with this limit you could use L'Hopital's rule, but you could also evaluate it using series. We'll write that the limit as x goes to zero of e to the x minus 1 minus x over x squared is equal to the limit of 1 plus x over 1 factorial plus x squared over 2 factorial plus x cubed over 3 factorial and so on minus 1 minus x just replace e with its uh, series and then we still have to divide by x squared it's Maclaurin series really okay so then this is the limit of x squared over 2 factorial plus x cubed over 3 factorial plus x to the fourth over 4 factorial and so on, because notice that our 1 and our x cancelled. It's almost like this problem was tailor-made. <laughs> and then this is the limit of 1 half plus x over 3 factorial plus x squared over 4 factorial plus x cubed over 5 factorial and so on just divide by x squared because power series are continuous we can now plug in 0 and just see that this is equal to 1 half last but not least there is a theorem that says that if you multiply or divide a power series that that power series converges so how about we multiply and divide some Maclaurin series for e to the x and sine x and sine and cosine so that we can find uh, the, just the first couple terms for these series. So e to the x times sine x is just 1 plus x over 1 factorial plus x squared over 2 factorial plus x cubed over 3 factorial and so on times x minus x cubed over 3 and so on for sine. So to multiply these guys, how about we line them up? We will do 1 plus x plus half x squared plus one six x cubed and so on times x minus one six x cubed and I'm gonna write the multiplication sign but it looks just like an x so watch out for that I'm multiplying it's not an x okay so how about we take everything and multiply it by x first so then 1 times x, I'm taking all this stuff and multiplying by x. So 1 times x is just x. And then we get x times x is x squared. And then we get half 
x cubed plus 1 6 x to the fourth and so on. So then let's take everything and multiply it by minus 1 6 x cubed now. So we get minus 1 6 x cubed minus 1 6 x to the fourth and so on. Just like how I used to multiply uh, numbers with a lot of digits. You'd multiply each one separately and then add them up. So we add these guys. And we get x plus x squared plus one third x cubed and so on. And that's three terms. I'm not even going to bother trying to do more. You can see how cumbersome it becomes after doing more than just a couple terms. So we could say e to the x sine x is equal to x plus x squared plus one third x cubed. And we can pretend that we know what the other terms are. Okay, how about tangent? So that's sine over cosine. So let's write those series now and try to divide them. So we've got x minus x cubed over 3 factorial plus x to the fifth over 5 factorial for sine. And then for cosine, we've got 1 minus x squared over 2, cosine's the even one, plus x to the fourth over 4 factorial. And we will try dividing these. So we'll do something kind of like uh, log division. We'll take 1 minus 1 half x squared plus 1 over 24 x to the fourth. And we'll try to put that into uh, x minus 1 6 x to the cubed plus 1 over 120 x to the fifth and so on. So dividing we uh, take x uh, divided by 1 we just get x so put that over there and we will do uh, multiplying now so we get x minus one half x cubed plus one over 24 x to the fifth and so on and then we subtract so we get one third x cubed minus 1 over 30 x to the fifth and so on so then we do our division again this time when we divide this way we get a uh, 1 third x cubed so multiplying we get 1 third x cubed minus 1 sixth x to the fifth and so on and we'll subtract these guys now so when we subtract we get 2 fifteenths x to the fifth I'm not even going to try to get the other terms so that's enough I think we can uh, just divide one last time and put 2 fifths 2 fifteenths x to the fifth up here and now we can write what tangent is equal to. Go a little ahead of myself. So tangent is x plus one third x cubed plus two fifteenths x to the fifth, and so on.